Uh, hey, everybody. So welcome to the HCIL Brown Bag. Uh, Celia insisted that as um, the co-director of the HCIM program, I could no longer just sit in my office quietly administering things. I, in fact, had to show up and talk to people about my research practice and what it is I do when I am not administering your program. So in light of that, I am also a second year PhD student uh, here doing uh, in a PhD in information studies. Uh, this is Celia, who is my research partner for these things. We met in the PhD program and we hit it off because we had actually nothing in common in any part of our research practices whatsoever, which was a delightful change after many, many, many years of talking to people about critical theory. We are here today to discuss our recent abandonware revival project, which is called Strain. So the thing on the table is the thing that we did with the abandonware Abandonware Revival Project, uh, and the thing that's powering it is the abandoned wear of a bunch of HCI devices that were viewed as disposable after about 2018. So the point of this project, is this my slide or yours? Okay. Um, the point of this project was to find useful applications for some abandoned gadgety technologies that have been hanging out in the HCI space for a number of years. Hardware or software projects that are discontinued before they achieve their full potential as projects. In particular, we wanted to showcase the Mayo armband by Thelmic Labs. You can wave your arm and risk the thing doing a thing. Um, this is the Mayo armband. It uses EMG sensors to detect muscle pulses in people wearing the armband and to, from there, control user interfaces with gesture, or at least that's what it promises to do. It was very popular when it came out because it enabled subtle hand gesture communication, and it was discontinued in 2018, just four years after its introduction. This is a frustratingly common outcome. If you work on novel gadgets, any novel gadgets, that are not backed by a very major corporation indeed, it is unlikely that your work will survive more than about four or five years, no matter how successful it is. Now, the Maya was kind of a feature of the years 2014, uh, when there was a lot of funding for fun projects like, um, you know, Theranos. We all remember Theranos. It had a lot of funding in 2014. Anyway, what we wanted to do was rescue the Mayo armband and couple it with another project that was abandoned for a different reason, despite being extremely functional and really useful. So the Mayo armband here is partnered with something called the Programmable Air, an open hardware project from Tinkermind that was launched with a crowdfunding campaign and eventually produced around 100 units that are absolutely perfect for working with soft robotics, which is its own discipline inside of the ACI, ACM and IEEE conference series. We wanted to combine this input device that was headed for the landfill with an underutilized output for air compression. And we found an unexpected application in what is my background field, which is public art. I do public art installations that are to show things off. They're to showcase stuff and to question what materials are available. I do creative technology and interaction design. Our inspiration for this was some of the better contemporary art that is available right now. So what is on this slide is uh, a few different resources that have come up through the 2010s, most notably Mira Lee's work at the Venice Biennale, I believe in 2022, Milk of Dreams. So we were looking around at museums, we were looking around at sculptures, and Mira Lee's work came up because it is so often overlooked that these kinetic sculptures are themselves massive feats of hydraulics engineering. So over here on the right, we have 2016's Can't Help Myself from the Guggenheim Art Museum from Sun Yuang and Peng Yu. Uh, can't Help Myself died recently. It finally ran out of hydraulic fluid. It was very tragic because, of course, this machine bleeds endlessly, always trying to scrape itself back into being. It's still an industrial arm, but the art of it comes from the dance. This type of work, this minimal work, is often critiqued in the art practice because it is not seen necessarily by people who come to art, and even people who work on projects like Stable Diffusion, as art. But it is, and there's a long tradition of it. For example, the Guggenheim Museum, again, sponsored a major retrospective of the artist Gego, who works only in lines and shapes of lines. Uh, Gego comes from Venezuela and had a very robust career as an artist and an architect who works only in the description of space with minimalist lines. These minimalist figures are often not reproduced or even seen inside of HCI or technology spaces as valid forms of expression, even as they use many of the same industrial processes and tools that we rely on every day. I also just really like the corpse flower. The corpse flower is a really robust art project idea for me because the corpse flower blooms so rarely and it smells so bad 
and it is so popular. Uh, if you don't know about it, it is a rare flower. This one's at the New York Botanic Gardens. It blooms once every couple of years, and it smells exactly like what happens if you leave chicken in your garbage can for just far too long. It's astonishing. It attracts every fly in the world to itself. So combining these four was the thing we were reaching for with the art project portion of this. Disposability, industrial processes, things left over, things left out, things that were rotting. This is also a long-standing interest of mine in the form of DIY or computational hardware, creative projects that are intended to be the interface between industrial machines and human outputs. I have been very influenced by visits to places like the MIT Media Lab, where, of course, they have a long-standing responsive flower garden, which I have pictured here in 2015, uh, by my colleagues like Lias Chang, who does notably DIY work. This is a type of cut called a living hinge, and this is a flower that blooms by pulling in and out. On the far side, you can see my work from 2017, Hothouse. These are capacitively reactive flowers that are focused on uh, a secretly opening aperture. I was really interested in how camera lenses worked at the time, and I wanted to know what the limits of 3D printing and laser cutting really were for the Hothouse project. What I found out the limits were was you actually cannot really build robots out of plywood. It is ill-advised to build lateral tension robots out of plywood. Instead, you must pour grease on those robots. So special thanks to Phil's Green Bottle Grease because this worked very nicely for the entire duration of the installation, which was about a week. The other thing though that goes through this work from then till now is that Hothouse was designed to not tax my volunteers. So almost all of my installations are volunteer-based. Hothouse's job was to be taken down in less than 20 minutes and to be put up in under two hours. It did that. We just folded it up. It lives in some boxes in my basement. It could go up any time I wanted as long as I was willing to show it again, which I'm absolutely not. You can come and have a look at the flowers if you want, but uh, no. So I'm interested in that level of disposability. And that brought us to how we needed to create an illusion of magic. Excuse me. Okay. The driving goal behind this design was to take some of that magic from Hothouse or from these other pieces where you can't really see the insides and make it so that we could have a performance that really celebrated what the Mayo armband said was possible with that device, which I do so love this armband. It is, it is bad, but there's no two ways about it. But this is how we made these choices, was that we needed to do a lot of work in advance, and then we needed to lie about it really, really persuasively. We had to hide some things. And one of the things that often comes up with HCI devices or performances is you can't get away from there being a giant rack of laptops on the table with them. You can see there is no, there is nothing up my sleeve. There is no laptop on this table. So if I carefully built that enclosure to encompass a little bit larger stuff, we could really effectively hide the robotics that make strain work. And that's what we wanted to have happen. We wanted to have the gestures do the work for us. In a classic, oh, I see a bunch of people have been in 7-Eleven with me and a bunch of people who are gonna be in 7-Eleven with me very soon. I really enjoy close magic. I think it's a really important piece of what we do as people who work with human computer interaction. So we had to obscure the technical elements of this work to avoid distracting from the key perceivable interactions the performance, the thing moving. We had to make it so it just didn't look like the laptop was doing it for you. And that's why we decided to use the Raspberry Pi. We made some choices with this project and I stand by them because I did not buy any new hardware for this project. And sometimes when you're a program director, what you're proud of is coming in under budget and on time. Truer words, eh? Anyway, all of these pneumatics everything were arranged into a laser cut box, partly to satisfy some requirements, because of course this did come out of a class, the signature for the class is on the box, but also because I am interested in living hinges. And part of disposability and reusability and creative technology, part of doing well in an artistic discipline like creative technology, is adhering to the aesthetic conventions of that discipline. So if I made this box nice, if I went to Terrapin Works and I got them to cut me a nice steel box and I got them to, you know, powder coat that box and make that box really pretty and make that box a sheer black box and it was really beautiful, it would be beautiful. It would be futuristic. It would look neon liberal, like the era we live in, right? But the thing is, it wouldn't look DIY. And so people would no longer buy it as a DIY project. They would have a higher standard of expectation for performance, but also it would be summarily rejected by makerism because makerism is about 
showing the aesthetic remains of the processes you have used to generate those parts. In this case, makerism has become constrained. It used to mean home engineering, so there were a lot of pit cars, which do have the powder-coated steel. But now, makerism has been reduced. It means laser cutters and 3D printers. And so if you wish to be taken seriously within a maker context, it's very important to reproduce at least enough of those expected aesthetics to remain within the container that is the maker space. There's a saying for this at Taco Bell. When you make a new meal at Taco Bell, you very famously can change either the shape or the taste, but you cannot change both the shape and the taste at once. If you want to know more about that, you should read up on the history of the Crunchwrap Supreme. It all tastes the same, but it's a brand new shape. And that is, in a nutshell, what making something inside of an aesthetic is like. And we all work within an aesthetic as creative technologists. So that is how we found treasure from trash. Our stir sticks allow straightforward volume creation. They're cheap. I stole them all from Vigilante in a bucket. Uh, some of them I'd had for 10 years in a background case. I used them back in my old home for doing barbecue. Our FDM prints are time limited. They must be no more than three minutes per print. And I failed at this on one of them. One of them takes 10 minutes to print and that's sad. They have to be no more than three minutes per print because honestly, I can't do things right on the first trial. If you've worked with me for four years, you know this now. I do things right on the second, third, or sometimes 15th try. I am a 15th try person. But by using these low cost parts with the common aesthetic palette, natural materials, white PLA only, only one color, only one color of raw, unpainted material, we can maintain that aesthetic, which gives us a lot of freedom with the natural latex balloons we chose to use for our pneumatic devices. Gosh, they're such a shape, aren't they? Oh, they're a shape. So uh, one of the fun things about shapes is you can work with pneumatics with lots of different types of balloon, but those balloons aren't free and they are crap. Pardon my language. Most latex balloons explode really, really easily. They don't sustain more than one stretch. They come to pieces really quickly. They rot out very fast and they don't have high quality control. And all of that is because latex balloons do not make people as angry as condoms do when they break. If a latex balloon breaks unexpectedly, people are sad. If a condom breaks unexpectedly and the wrong person it breaks on, you get sued. So condoms are manufactured to a really high standard of repeatability, of stretch, of usability. And they are a convenient and human size for working with prototyping or maquettes. Maquettes are a really important part of major sculpture. If I were to take strain and make it bigger, would I necessarily use these particular sleeves or balloons? No, I might use one of those dancing guys from you know outside of the tire store. But for something that has to be small and portable, displayable in a bunch of different contexts, you can do a lot worse than having a balloon that can stand being stretched 10,000 times in a row without snapping. It's really important to be able to do that if you're gonna work with soft robotics. They also reinforce the overall aesthetic, disposability, things that can be thrown away, things that often are. So. So one of the major ideas that influenced our design for strain was how we would animate the sculpture um, in an organic way, as Alex had said. Um, we wanted a kind of magic where the sculpture would move in response to an input system that was more interesting than just pressing buttons. Uh, so during my undergraduate years, I was a neuroscience researcher at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And I worked a bit with electromyography or EMG, uh, which can detect muscle activation signals in the body. So Alex had mentioned they had an old Thalmic Labs uh, armband lying on a shelf and they didn't know what to do with it. I was like, well, we can do something with this that isn't buttons. Um, so. It's moving because I'm doing things. Yeah. How do you scroll this down also? Thank you. That's a different slide. Mm -hmm. That's a different slide. What is happening? Go back. I don't know how your computer works. Okay. Scroll. Thank you. Breaking the illusion. And now, yeah, breaking the illusion. Breaking the illusion breaking my own angry. <laughs> curious yes, it is. Anyway, so the Mayo armband contains eight of these EMG uh, sensors all along the inside of the band. Uh, whenever you flex or extend your hands, small voltage spikes occur in the forearm muscles that control your fingers. And the EMG sensors can detect both the strength and the timing of these signals. So the Mayo reads in this raw sensor data and analyzes the signal patterns to figure out details about what muscles are being activated. For example, which fingers are moving even if the overall hand is still. Um, and this allows for really nuanced gesture tracking capabilities. So if I lift two fingers, the Mayo can detect those specific muscles firing separately from the others, and they would label it as a pose. 
the ability to decode finger positions is what made EMG armbands so groundbreaking when they first came around. Uh, the Mayo also features a nine-axis inertial measurement unit to track overall arm motion. So combined, these features of muscle activity and limb tracking allow us to use gesture input to control our pneumatic sculpture in an organic and interesting way, even if it's a little finicky. Um, so enabling the pneumatic animation for strain is the programmable air, which is an open source Arduino-based platform that uses pressure sensing and valve control to help people prototype soft robots. The programmable air was created, as Alex has said, by Amitab Srivastava uh, or Tinkermind and launched for crowdfunding in 2019 at NYU's Interactive Telecommunications Program Summer Camp, which you have attended. And if they have questions about it, they should ask you. Uh, despite being a great tool, as a solo effort, there were a lot of challenges expanding it commercially. So it remains a small patch passion project for Amitab. This unit came to us by being at the right conference at the right time and is an argument for picking a community and then participating in that community to know what's happening. Uh, being based on the open Arduino platform, the programmable air was straightforward to connect to our existing Mayo data pipeline. This allowed us to prog programmatically and dynamically control pressure levels by monitoring onboard sensor data. Uh, custom open hardware passion projects might be small scale, but their existence is important and it can enable incredible experimentation and in novel applications like strain. Uh, and if you're interested in this type of work, you might be interested in the open source hardware association with the link in the bottom right of that slide. Uh, their summit is in Montreal this year and they do a lot of cool work with things like this. So having gathered all of these pieces, the Mayo, the programmable air and our concept, we needed to bring them together into one cohesive system. So the flow works like this. Uh, the Mayo detects gestures via, EM via EMG and sends that muscle activation data over Bluetooth to a Raspberry Pi. The Pi then formats those poses into signals that the Arduino can understand, strings, which are sent over the serial port. Uh, the Arduino then takes in these strings and runs valves on the programmable air to control airflow into the sculpture. Uh, enclosing the Pi and the pneumatics into a custom laser cut enclosure allows us to hide these technical elements, leaving only the armband and the inflating sculpture visible to the audience. This focus on selective visibility enhances the magic of strain. We're using gestures that apply that appear to entice the sculpture into animating and have a will of its own. Uh, there were a lot of interesting challenges when it came to programming all of these components to work together, however. So let's go dive into that. <clears throat> now, while it was certainly an innovative device when it was released, the Mayo armband, as perhaps demonstrating by itself, has lived up its reputation of being a deeply impractical and very finicky HCI device. We had to battle a lot, and I mean a lot, of its quirks when trying to implement it as the input method for this project. So first, while the Mayo is in theory parable using any Bluetooth connection, in practice, it's actually very difficult to do without its proprietary USB dongle. So the device has no on-screen pair connection and the dongle is pre-programmed with the correct handshakes for the armband. Bluetooth generally is a weird standard uh, because it's closed and because it was published incomplete, there's about 17 different extremely finicky ways to implement Bluetooth connections. So the dongle means we didn't have to worry about pairing the device, but we did have to worry about a dedicated USB port for it. Additionally, in order to turn the Mayo on, you have to actually plug it into the device the Bluetooth dongle is connected to and then unplug it again. The armband doesn't feature any sort of power button or switch. So this design quirk really informed our decision to have a laser cut enclosure that has an easy accessible door because every time we turn this thing on, we have to plug it in and plug it out again, uh, which is a little silly. Additionally, in order to turn the Mayo, uh, da -da, the official configuration software for the armband is also tied to a defunct platform. So with limited ability to calibrate sensors or lock the gesture controls, the Mayo really enjoys taking possession of whatever device it is uh, connected to. This, if it is your laptop, it really loves to open YouTube or Netflix all of the time um, because it will often interpret gestures like me moving around and talking to you as me doing something for this. Uh, so that's really annoying to work with. And it's also a big reason why we put it on the Raspberry Pi because I was really sick of it opening YouTube. Every time I tried to say something, remove my hand or unplug a wire. Um, so the requirement in addition of the armband, because it has to stay in place so it can read your gestures, uh, it requires you to press rigid EMG sensors firmly against your skin at all times while using it for responsiveness. And this causes a lot of discomfort over time. Uh, this is particularly annoying because the Mayo armband actually has to warm up for quite a few minutes before it can work. So you have to leave this on your arm for five to eight minutes before it can actually read gestures successfully. And at that point, this thing doesn't move because it literally wants. So it's stretched around my arm to stay in place. And like, you know, you take it off, it's got the marks on it. You're like, this is not practical. Uh, so while potentially amazing and capable, these flaws likely contributed to the Mayo's commercial downfall. Uh, 
It's just not a practical device to use for any applications. People have been trying to use it for controlling medical devices. They've been trying to use it for ASL technology and accessibility, but just it wasn't designed well for the user in mind to use it on a long-term scale. It was designed for some flashy tech guy to point and have an idea and do things while the slides did things behind him. And that's kind of all it's good for, and that's okay. Nevertheless, it's also good for this. So connecting all of our hardware components together required more extensive software wrangling, a lot more extensive software wrangling than either of us thought this project was going to entail. The Maya libraries were not built to directly control systems like the programmable air. And given the nature of the files themselves, modifying them required us to use reverse engineering software. We originally considered the use of Ghidra, but that is software from the NSA. And once you have to consider using software from the NSA, you're like, is this project worth it? Is it really? Um, instead, we thankfully discovered that DNSpy was also suitable for modifying the files we needed, uh, which is more popularly used to mod games and ruin the lives of other players in Grand Theft Auto V's multiplayer mode, for anyone who's ever played that and been really mad at someone with a billion dollars who bazookas you in the face. Um, so we also had to deal with an issue of incompatible clone boards. During our debugging process, we discovered that some of our serial miscommunication problems could be attributed to the fact that our programmable error was actually connected to a counterfeit Arduino nano board. Those are a thing. Uh, they're actually quite interchangeable for other projects, and they're really hard to tell the difference between them. Unfortunately for us, one of the main differences is the drivers on it. So the drivers that we had on our uh, counterfeit board were completely incompatible with the Raspberry Pi, and we ended up having to swap the whole board. And that took a while to figure out that that was a problem, because there's not a lot of good resources on this when you do innovative projects. You can't be like, hey, I'm trying to connect these two abandonware devices. Help me, Arduino Forum. It's not helpful. Um, as part of our process for getting the devices to talk to one another, we decompiled some hackathon software for the Maya to check its connections. Uh, this was created by Atomic Labs, kind of fired developer from 2016. He just went to a hackathon. He's like, I'm making a program. It's called Maya Arduino. It is an EXE file. It will only work on Windows. It's going to take over all of your serial communication ports so you can connect to this thing. Uh, this obviously didn't work. We had to rewrite a portion of the programmable air libraries itself in order to untangle the device specific baud rates and timers that this My Arduino program was causing us problems with. Uh, the two boards can only sustain one plain serial port connection at a time at any given baud rate, which must match in order for the communications to work properly. And this is really complicated for the Arduino. It meant that we couldn't have the serial monitor open at the same time as we had like the code block open, otherwise the board would restart. So we couldn't actually see our code while we were running it. And that was really annoying. Uh, so this meant that the existing hackathon Mayo to Arduino code block the Arduino serial port's uh, ability to receive inputs or display outputs for any given source, which wasn't going to work for our project. I think we just keep scrolling, but well, then we're going to just, it's fine. I will manage. So anyways, we put, why are you here? <laughs> That's fine. So what we ended up doing was we uh, decided to poke around on GitHub to see what anyone else had done with this project. And we were able to find some software libraries that interfaced with the Mayo's raw sensor data streams. Uh, but they were quite old. And when I say old, I mean that they were developed in Python 2.7. And for those of you who aren't aware, Python 2.7 is the version of Python that was released in July of 2010, uh, which was for almost 14 years ago. These libraries were not compatible with directly actually in the programmable air or really with an Arduino at all. Uh, so to circumnavigate this, we ended up having to rewrite it and build up up-to-date custom Python code for ourselves for the Raspberry Pi that interprets the Mayo's gesture data and translates the poses into simple serial commands that are then communicated to the Arduino. We then wrote up a small custom Arduino package to both listen for our gesture signals and also maintain homeostasis with a programmable air system based on atmospheric pressure readings. Um, in doing this, we created a complete workaround for the existing Mayo Arduino hackathon program. It's just mad, um, which was previously the only publicly available code to work with these two pieces of hardware in tandem. So if you need that, let us know and we'll send you the GitHub for it. Ultimately, the software pipeline demonstrates how integrating discontinued hardware really pushes you to creatively bridge those interfaces. But you should note that if this creativity involves software crimes, you should remember to check if state level actors have already done the work for you. No, but it's really true. Maybe Arliss will fund the next one. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've already talked a little bit about this, but a key aesthetic decision in this was to reinforce the abandonware portion of this, the parts that were broken that we already had to sew together inside of all these technology systems that were always meant as demos uh, to make them just more more, just to, to bring them together, to make them beautiful, to make them consistent. So most of you here, I think, have maybe taken visual design one. I see some somebody here 
who like I know some of you are very, very, very good at aesthetics and probably already know this, but a key part of aesthetics, if you're bad at aesthetics, is just to reduce the number of colors you're working with. It's actually why I wear black all the time. It makes it easier. Uh, so we worked really hard to make sure that we were using parts that could be thrown away easily and cheaply and fast so that we would not be wasting gigantic amounts of time on one piece of the project only to come to the end of the project and realize we didn't have a project. Uh, we also wanted to shout out in this talk specifically the Health Center for their very lovely and free balloons. We uh, really respect their promotion of safe and empowered sexuality. So if you would like to go find some balloons, the Health Center has a variety of them downstairs. Uh, they also sell grease in case you choose to laser cut a robot that has sheer parts out of plywood. That grease might even work. But the point here is that these durable yet sensitive air bladders really work effectively to animate the form. Other types of latex would not work as well for this because they are designed to stretch out once and to stay stretched out and to not collapse. Whereas these ones are intended to move a little bit more and a little bit more affordably. This helps us to highlight how inexpensively ideas can be prototyped and how inexpensive it is to actually pursue these things if you are an HCI student who wants to do prototyping. There's a temptation to use the 3D printer for seven hours straight to build the entire enclosure. No, go buy a Tupperware. Put a hole in the Tupperware. Use the 3D printer to build a custom port for the hole that you put in the Tupperware. It is much, much cheaper and much easier and more aesthetically consistent to make use of the industrial society in which you already find yourself living. Dollar General is a horror show, but Dollar General is also kind of a miracle. It's a weird miracle, just like Woolworths before it. I guess Woolworths was Canadian. The thing is, to get this to work properly did involve just hundreds of iterations of things. As is usual, the devil is in the details. If you want to make something like this work, if you want to make something like this work at a sub-millimeter scale using an off-the-shelf 3D printer, even one as good as the Bamboo PS1, which is a Prusa, but did, it works properly and well on the first try, it just takes a lot of effort. You have to think about things like humidity because your sticks will change size if it's humid or not humid. Welcome to Maryland. It's always humid and not humid all at once. You have to be able to measure things and cut them and be willing to be impatient with yourself and willing to throw it in the trash. So there are a lot of different interfaces that went through to make this work. Did that change? Uh, yes, this is the original st strain design here. So this video shows what strain looked like before we actually arranged the parts. So we got to this part of the project where I had prototyped a beautiful organic spine and everything was working and I thought through it. I used did this by looking at soft robotics from Carrie Love and Matthew Borgatti up in New York. They have a beautiful book called Make. It's about making grippers. I was like, surely the gripper will work the way it was designed to. No, it works completely in reverse if you change the side that it can bend on. But you can see from this video that like it's little, it's hard to see, but the first version of this didn't have anything arranged, and so it didn't look like anything. So the next thing you do after finding things that are aesthetically consistent in color and material is talk to somebody who has a sense of arrangement. Because often, even quite small parts, even quite small screens, can be made to be much more functional by organizing the gestalt of the image so it hangs together, so it communicates more information through only the shape of, hi Bill, dance, through the choreography of the sequence. So how did we prototype that project backbone? This was the part I really enjoyed the most. This is the part I liked the best. It was not the day that we found out what the serial port baud rate was, which that was a very good day, although it involved a lot of lying on the floor thinking I'm never going to get this done. No, uh, this was my favorite part. So this came up at 12 in the middle of the night and I just bolted awake and went and ran and wrote it down just like they say you do in books. It's very bad for your students the next day when you do that, so I don't recommend it. But I was thinking about obviously reproduction, clearly, because you can't work in printmaking or 3D printing and not come up with reproduction. And this comes up a lot in that field. Like in Canada, if you have a master's degree in printmaking, you also have to be certified that you're not a uh, counterfeit artist. And then, of course, a lot of people who have reproduction, who, who have these degrees, they go on to work in things like 3D printing cells. So reproduction is a very big and broad term. It's not just, you know, condoms, but it's lots of different things. So I was thinking about repeating parts and organic forms and things that were efficient for holding power together. And so I came up with this, this nested wishbone and shackle system where the shackle holds the balloon in place while the wishbone spine nests into it to form a spine. I was thinking about artists like Iris Van Herpen and Henry Moore, who are very famous artists. And I was also thinking about all of those deer out on the trail and how 
how they keep eating the poison ivy and then kicking it next to the highway. So there are lots of different ways to get your shapes. And what's important when you're working with this stuff is this is still just PLA and stir sticks. You have to pick the piece of the project you care about to work on. The next piece I cared about were the clips. The clips started out as something different. The clips started out as things to support my mechanical keyboard habit. So I love mechanical keyboards. I love sculpting mechanical keycaps and I want to be able to display them. So I was building a display system for my mechanical keycaps that I could use to make it modular and make it big and make it custom. And purely by coincidence, it turned out the hole I'd left for the keycap stem to go into was the exact right diameter to fit a pneumatic cable. Now, was that a coincidence? No, I'm living and working in the United States of America. We have ISO standards. ISO standards mean things pretty much have a shape and a size and a quarter of an inch is a very standard shape and size. For those of us who are from other places, that's 6.53 millimeters, which I've memorized because I am Canadian. There are so many steps in these prototyping processes to make small things. And that means that small things have to become big victories, which is why I like to use cheap materials to get the volume. The expensive thing is my time to make the volume go together at a very small level. Of course, I love miniatures. That's just me. But this type of work involves a lot of work per step that will not be visible if you succeed at your job, which is also true of a lot of HCI projects. The things that make the Mayo visible, the things that make the Mayo flashy, the things that make the Mayo fun are the things that make the Mayo bad. The programmable air is not flashy. It just works. It uses a basic open source thing. And so the connection between the two becomes dynamically interesting if we talk about this as a creative technology piece, because one half of the project was a commercial success. The Mayo company, Thalmic Labs, got sold twice, first to Control Labs and then to Meadow, which is who still runs them and who shut them down. Programmable Air is mostly languishing in Amitabh's basement, I think. He might have sold all 100 units, and those of us who work with those units love those units. But there's a reason why Carrie Love is directly contributing to the core Programmable Air repositories, and there's a reason why I will later go and contribute to those repositories as well with annotations as to how to expand this project. They are both small projects. Neither of them is large. But if we aspire to things in the Academy that are beyond that, it's important to make sure the systems talk to each other. So. This is our It's a Live video, which is, this in there? Yeah. Ooh. so this is it working. This was our demo video in case we couldn't get this set up today. You have just seen it doing that. It is always important to take video of your work. I learned that from Nick Puckett at the University of, uh, the Ontario College of Art and Design University, who was like, Alex, why aren't you filming your master's thesis? And I said, Nick, because I'm going to die. And he said, fair enough. Anyway, I take videos of things now and you should too. So we have this working, but you can see it working. And so our future work for this project, what makes this an HCI project? Why does this belong in an information college? Why is this an art project, but also something more? Our future work would be to do things like decode what is being sent from the Mayo. So right now the Mayo hosts all of its configuration on board. That means you calibrate it once on a Windows laptop for preferably, let's be clear, a 25-year-old man from Waterloo, Ontario's arm. That is whose arm this is for. Um, and then you leave it. And that calibration stays on board the Mayo. And then it sends one of six poses out from that calibration. But you can guess also get raw data outputs. So that opens a window where those raw data outputs are plugged to different machines. And you can calibrate it differently on different machines with a little bit of effort or a different interface. So there's a possibility to do an open calibration for the Mayo that ignores the onboard calibrations that are stored inside of the device itself. We could try to figure out how to get a pair without the dongle. If there are Bluetooth experts in this space, I would love to talk to you. I'm sure it pairs without the dongle, right? It has to. It's Bluetooth, right? We use it for everything. I don't have a lot of faith in Bluetooth. We could build other poses. We could have it fire on the Arduino faster. So it's about a one to two second delay now, which you've seen a couple of times during the talk when C has moved their hand open or closed. Um, and we could also go right in, burn the thing and reverse the Mayo itself so it can be calibrated on board without the Thalmic Lab software, which when we presented this project at uh, CCC in December, the Germans were really enthusiastic about that. So I've signed up for the embedded hardware hacking class. We'll see how it goes there. They're not really happy to see me there, but we'll see how it goes. Future work, Mayo is an HCI device. Still me. The Mayo and the Raspberry Pi combination are compelling to a lot of researchers. So we are not the first people to try this. We're not even gonna try and claim it. There are a bunch of more recent ones. Uh, locked links like this represent a lot of the current workspace with the device and these devices die all the time. In a lot of different 
pu papers published about this device when it was still popular, when it was still being produced. And again, it stopped being produced in 2018. You can still get them online for like $150 maybe. Um, it was really popular because the promise of the open portions of this hardware, the EMG sensors, the nine axis hinge, all of that stuff seemed really, really, really promising. So people wrote a lot of papers about these device combinations. And it is possible that the leftovers from that manufacturing will have a long tail. If you can get your hands on one of these, not mine, you can't have mine. You could maybe have the development unit, but you could get one. Um, but if you can get one, it might actually offer some really interesting spaces to work with. And people are certainly seeing places to work with this device because of its sensor package. Uh, and as our computational power and algorithms progress, it's possible that some of those linear algebra regression models might have something nice to say to us about these devices. But to realize that promise, ironically, what a device like this needs is actually to not be commercialized. It opens a space for what acad academic research is good for and useful for, and what low pressure open source research is good for, good for and is helpful for. So places like the Open Source Hardware Association or these labs, the HCIL, or this program here in the iSchool, we have possibilities that are open to us that will never be open to people who are under the pressure to commercialize, especially in an era after interest rates have come back as a concept in this world. So this was born during a period when there was no money anywhere for anyone who wasn't being invested in VC. And a lot of your professors probably remember that era. We were like, really? Negative interest rates on our savings accounts? Are you sure about that, Credit Suisse? Um, but now the interest rates are back. People can save money in other ways, which means that investors don't have to throw money at these types of armbands. And this seems pretty depressing if you came up during startup land, if you were used to the big ticket things being signed off to people who were fresh out of school, who were in their mid-20s, if the lottery tickets seem to be paying off. But the thing is, the thing that would save an armband like this, a device like this, research like this, is to not have that pressure to get the exit ticket for Andreessen Horowitz. It's to not get the exit ticket is the thing that lets us do the creative research. It's what lets us do the low pressure exploration is to be like, hey, how does this work? How can we use this in future? What can we pair it with and how can we make it magical? So how did we make this magical? Here is where I shout out all my friends and colleagues on this campus who have been so supportive over the last four years. An incredible asset that enabled this project is the Sing Sandbox. The Sing Sandbox in the CS department is never not at risk of being defunded because the CS department is like, why do we have a nice big greenhouse filled with cool stuff for every student when we want more classrooms for our wildly oversubscribed computer science classes? So you should go and use the Sing Sandbox and you should tell everybody how great it is all the time because it is truly an excellent makerspace and it is astonishing that it is so well run by Gordon Crago, who is uh, an alumni of the tech shop sequence of makerspaces from back when we had hope about that sort of thing. This place has more than 5,000 square feet of tools and facilities for woodworking, laser cutting, 3D printing, electronics, and pretty much anything else you want to do. They have a full video production lab in there. It is incredible. So it's a warm, friendly, open space. It's on the first floor of the Sing Sandbox, not the mezzanine, the first floor at the end of the hallway. You can get in by swiping in. You can qualify for working on the tools by signing up for the Elms and just doing the tool certifications, which is uh, how we got into it. Sorry, that's my next slide. Our special thanks also, of course, is again, University Health Center. I, uh, so I don't have a lot of experience with the American healthcare system. I signed up for Kaiser when I got here, which was like 50% a mistake, but not really. I don't know. It seems fine. I don't know how to get stitches in this country anymore. It's weird. I just do them myself when it happens. Um, the University Health Center is the cleanest, friendliest, nicest, and most effective medical system I have actually found during the last four years here. Uh, you don't need to be afraid of them. If you need to go get lab tests, if you need to go get a doctor, if you need to see somebody, if you need a pharmacy, the University Health Center is really committed to your health and well-being to a degree that even my extremely highly paid doctors are not. So I shout out the University Health Center. If you have not checked out your benefits from them that I assume you have been forced subscribed to, please actually do. They're actually a really good place, even among other universities. I'm impressed.
And our last slide is, of course, my acknowledgments. My first acknowledgement goes out to my bros at NYC Resistor, one of the original makerspaces. If you want to know where 3D printers come from, you can research their old website and see Brie Pettis talking about his slow downward spiral into running MakerBot. Uh, I love NYC Resistor. I had a residency there this summer where I worked on uh, matrix panels, which I would like to bring to something later in this year. Um, and through that, I would like to say a special thanks to Amitab and Carrie Love specifically. Carrie is an adjunct who teaches at at ITP New York and has experience putting together pneumatics for both NASA and for the Broadway show Spider-Man, Turn Out the Dark, but it wasn't Carrie's fault. She's actually quite a great customer. Um, these are my colleagues. Without them, I wouldn't have anybody to think with. And so you need to shout your colleagues out at the end of talks. The other person I need to shout out is Dr. Huai Shu Peng, who runs one of the best interactive technology classes on this campus. So Huai Shu Peng runs Interaction Technologies for Human Computer Interaction, which is a weird name for a class that is very, very, very challenging. And I personally found deeply annoying, which is how I knew I was learning things the whole time. It is a fantastic class. Dr. Peng's class is great. Dr. Peng's TA is great. They deserve all of the awards. Awards. And if you have extra space to take a class, I would recommend actually having a boo at that class because it is excellent. I now know how to use timers in an Arduino. Am I happy to have that knowledge? No. No, I am not. No. But do I have it? I do. He is fantastic. I would not have been able to do one-tenth a project as good as this without the pressure that that class put on me last fall. Um, special thanks also, of course, goes to my research colleague. We have been working together successfully for the better part of a year now, and it has been a really good and productive relationship. It's a good idea in graduate school to make friends with people who you have nothing in common with, because it will help you learn and think in new ways and new directions. Uh, and my last shout out, of course, goes to my home conference, which I'm not going to this year, but if you happen to have a way to pull like four extra figures of American dollars out of your pocket and maybe you know how to sleep on someone's couch in New York and you're also not afraid of cockroaches, ITP camp at NYU is an absolutely fantastic workshop to go to. It is an unconference. It has been run for almost 15 years by Kate Hartman, who has a tenured position at the Ontario College of Art and Design University. Uh, it is a place where people who are in the start or the midpoint of their careers can go to learn absolutely everything fun, interesting, and cool that is currently coming up in interaction technology for creative practice. It is also really NYU money. So it's a good idea to think about that and figure out what you're going to do about that first. But if you want to have something exciting, you should keep it in your mind for future times. It's not always great for current students because of how much it costs. But a lot of us just go back year after year after year after year or every two or three years or something. So there's a huge alumni population of NYU who never went to NYU and we all send each other notes like, hey, I just wrote this book on soft robotics and I am adjuncting at NYU now. Beautiful notes, right? So that is my last of these slides. Um, and I would like to say thank you also to the HCIL for hosting this talk for us. I believe this brings us in at exactly 45 minutes. And I would love to answer any questions. If you have questions at this time, you would also love to answer questions. Okay. Yeah, okay.